There are some other du'as, but not what the people say, Rabbana uh, walak alhamd wa shukr or something like that. Make sure that what you're saying in that position is mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this in itself, the saying of these azkar, wajib. The tashahud in the middle, if the prayer consists of four rakah, the tashahud, the, the saying of the tashahud is wajib. And the salawat in the end, in the end, just before giving salah, uh, salam, is wajib according to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So it's very important to know what is wajib. Because if you leave out one of these things, you need to do something. You cannot just leave and go. You need to do something. You need to make sajdu sahu. As for the sunan, these sunan are there to make your prayer perfect. But if you miss them out purposely or by mistake, there is no problem. There is no problem. Your prayer is valid. Your prayer is valid, inshallah. So, what is a sunnah? Um, a surah after Surah Al Fatiha, sunnah. Saying, Allah li warhamni wajburni wahdini warzukni between the two sajdas, in the sitting between the two sajdas, saying this dua is sunnah. Uh, dua after the salawat. Just before Taslim, Sunnah. The second Taslim, according to a vast majority of the ulama, is Sunnah. Just one is uh, obligatory, the other one is Sunnah. Dhikr after Dua, after Dua, the Dhikr after Salah. Dua and Dhikr after Salah is Sunnah. Raising the hands, Sunnah. Having a Sutra is Sunnah. According to some ulama, wajib, but vast majority say is Sunnah. So these things, if you leave them out, you don't have to do anything. If you would do a sajid sahu here, it would be wrong. It be wrong. You didn't do anything which makes the salah void. And just to mention here that um, the sutra of the imam when you pray in jama'ah is sufficient. It's not that every single person behind the imam needs to have a sutra. And I'm telling you this because when we were praying in Medina, somebody who's very, I mean, very close to me, he just started to, uh, started to pray in his life and he didn't know this ruling. And you know how these in Medina are busy. It's busy. So we were standing in prayer and there was a person coming through the sufuf uh, looking for a place to pray. And this person who's very close to me who just started praying knows the hadith. We don't let the devil go in front of us. Stop him. And he would stop it, it would actually go very, very far. Alhamdulillah, it didn't end up in fighting. So you see where knowledge comes into place here. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma would write in Mina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was praying in Mina with the Sahaba. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma was riding a donkey between the Sufuf. And nobody would say anything in the end. So you know where knowledge comes into place, inshallah. So it's very, very important that we know and we learn about the salah. If that was complicated now about the shuru, the conditions of salah, the arkan of salah, uh, the wajibat of salah, the sunnah of salah, if you heard that for the first time in your life, make sure you're going to learn it. Make the niyyah right now that you need to go and purchase a book which speaks about these things and learn them. Because it can mean the make or break of your salah. If you miss out, and we all miss, we all make mistakes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made a mistake in prayer. Allah knows best, probably just to show us how to deal with a mistake. But he made a mistake. So we need to know what to do when we made a mistake. What is it that we left out? Is it a rukun? Is it a condition, a short, a sunnah? What can we do? So this lack of awareness of what we need to do when we miss out something in prayer, this is sometimes a very, very big mistake in itself. A big mistake in itself. Now, as the time is running out, a very good book to actually read when it comes to the topic of the today's uh, the mistakes, the common mistakes in prayer, is a book called The Clarified Ruling of Mistakes Done in Salah, translated in English, original in Arabic, written by Sheikh Mashur Hassan Al-Salman. 
get it, read it. It's very, very beneficial. Very, very beneficial, inshallah. Many, many mistakes consist some four to five hundred pages, but it's very, very beneficial. Ayat and a hadith in English, nicely written. Please, if you want to learn something about salah, go and get this book or any similar book and learn about salah. Please. Now, in the end, I would like to mention that many, many times the Muslims actually fight in the mosque. I don't say it doesn't happen. It does happen in this country, everywhere in the world. Unfortunately, it does happen. It's often because of very small issues, trivial issues. Well, there's nothing trivial in salah, but it's not worth. Sometimes it's a sunnah. Sometimes it's something which the ulama have a difference in opinion, but it's not, it's not worth debating about it. Non the, yani, subhanallah, what about fighting then? When it comes to ikhtilaf, the difference in opinion between the ulama, we need to differentiate. There is a difference between something we call ikhtilaf mu'tabar and something we call ikhtilaf ghair mu'tabar. Ikhtilaf mu'tabar is a difference in opinion which is based on a valid proof. All the ulama who have difference in opinion about this, they have a valid proof for what they are saying, for what they are saying. Either from the Quran or the Sunnah or Sahih Qiyas or Ijma. They have a valid proof. And if that is the case, there is no point of debating. There is no point of debating. Um, like for example, touching the Mus'haf without wudu, or is blood um, najasa or not, things which are so many different, different opinions. Do my knees need to touch the floor first, or my hands when I go to sajda? Where do I put my hands in prayer? Things like that. There is a lot, a lot to read about, and the, the ulama have different opinion, and the difference in opinion here is called khilaf mu'tabar. There is no point of debating. Yes, we can speak, we can talk, we can try to convince each other about what is most probably right or wrong, but there's no point of debating. And I should not say fighting then, subhanallah. People are fighting about these things. It shouldn't be the case at all. We are ikhwan, subhanallah. We are, we are Muslim brothers and sisters who come to worship Allah Jalla Filullah in the mosque. When it comes to ikhtilaf ghair mutabar, then there is a difference. Ikhtilaf ghair mutabar can be rajih or marjuh. It can be either right or wrong. It could be that a alim has misunderstood something. We respect the alim still. It can be sahih or khata. It can be a very, very strange opinion. A very strange opinion about music, for example, being halal. It's a very strange opinion. That is there. We still respect that particular alim who said it. But we know it's wrong. And if we have ikhtilaf ghair mutabar, what we need to do is respect each other. But then we need to try to explain to each other. Billati hi ahsan. Billati hi ahsan. Then it's worth debating. If you have some kind of knowledge about it, it's worth debating. You should debate and try to convince and try to make the other person aware of what is right and what is wrong. Billati hi ahsan. In a very nice in a very nice way, good manners. And if you see that the other person doesn't understand, فَعَرِدْ عَنُ الْجَاهِلِينَ Order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turn away from the ignorant people. Turn away from the ignorant people. Don't let it come to fight and, you know, raising the voices and all of that. That shouldn't be the case even here. Even in khilaf ghair mutabar. Don't let it happen. If you see that the debate goes and the other person doesn't understand, doesn't want to understand, doesn't want to see the overwhelming adilla, the dalil, and so on, turn away from the ignorant people. 
As for the last kind of difference in opinion, where it is either haq or batil, it's a, a matter of following the truth or something which is completely wrong, like some rafida quoting ayat from the Quran for a very, very wrong reason, switching the meaning, making up a hadith, these things, there is no respect anymore. There is no respect for that. There is a debate, but here we, we need to get to the point. I'm not saying fighting in itself in the mosques, but here we need to be very clear about our positions. But most of the times it's actually not that. Most of the times when people debate and raise voices and fight inside the masajid, it's because, it's because of khilaf mutabr. Any things which are acceptable by any means, there is delil for it. You can do it. And that in itself is a mistake. It's actually one of the biggest mistakes of salah. One of the biggest common mistakes in salah is that we debate about things which are not that important. And I'd like to conclude, inshallah, my talk today with this uh, point. Please remind everybody and remind yourselves that don't debate about things which are not very, very important. But let us be ikhwan, inshallah. And let's learn about the deen. And let's learn about the salah again. Let's learn about the salah again. I cannot claim that I know everything about salah. I cannot claim it. I will not claim it. And I will say that every time when I go back to the books, even now on my journey, when I was opening a book of fiqh and reading, I, was, I, I found new things in there. The talk about salah is a never-ending talk. And it's worth to go back again and again and again because it is the second most important thing after the shahada. Please bear that in mind.